So now let's take a closer look at the back of Sideman so we can learn a little bit more about these pretty little things which are called vacuum tubes or thermionic valves. Sideman has a total of 12 of them that we find in the tone generators and in the amplifier. But before I get any further with that, I want to show you something cool. This here is my new favorite tool. It was given to me by a friend who's a retired television repairman. It's just a little rubber mallet. Now this was an important tool when troubleshooting busted televisions because um, what he would do is open up the TV and he would knock away on the tubes. Now if there was a tube that had a problem, if he knocked on it, you could sort of hear that there's something in there shaking, shaking around. So in the case of Sideman, if there was a broken tube and we, we knocked on it, we would hear this sound coming through the speaker. So I thought that that was pretty neat. But unfortunately, just like my little rubber mallet here, tubes are obsolete and we don't really find them anymore. They've been replaced with little semiconductors, um, such as these guys here. Now, what's kind of interesting is you could totally rebuild Sideman today using these a couple handfuls of these components instead of the big tubes. Even though vacuum tubes are obsolete and we don't really find them around anymore, they're still very interesting to learn about. So I thought that I would invite a special guest in to enlighten us on the topic. And that special guest just happens to be uh, my assistant here, Daniel Stiegler. And Daniel's not just here to help me pick up Sidemen when you got to move him onto the bench. He's also here because he's uh, quite serious about vacuum tubes and he uses them a lot to build amplifiers. Um, so, Daniel, a couple quick questions. First of all, why do we need a vacuum inside of a tube? And why is it that Sideman gets so hot when he's been generating rhythms for a while? Um, that's a good set of questions. Uh, these are both tightly connected. Um, in order to play around with the stream of electrons, we first need that stream of electrons. We need a stream of electrons. And um, as you might have noticed, you get a glow when you turn on the wells. Sideman does glow. And um, this is coming from a metal wire that's heated up, in, up to a glowing state mm -hmm. because when you heat up a piece of metal until it glows it uh, emits electrons. Ah, you mean thermionic emission? Exactly, mm. that's why these are also called thermionic valves. And um, just like you might remember this from um, light bulbs um, that you need a vacuum because in the presence of oxygen, a glowing wire which is burn away. Right, but we're talking about old-fashioned tungsten light bulbs here, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Very interesting. So I guess this does make sense why Sideman um, gets a little bit stinky after a while that it's been on. Because I've noticed if I've been hanging out in the tone generator, um, I start to get an itchy throat and I start to cough and I realize that Simon is a dusty old machine and when it gets hot, that dust is warm and it's kind of floating around again. So I should probably clean up Simon in order to have a cleaner and healthier workplace, shouldn't I? Probably. Uh, huh. Now we're going to take a closer look at the anatomy of the vacuum tube. And for this, Daniel has brought in a very special specimen. Now Daniel, what are we looking at here? This is an EMAC 100 TH. EMAC 100 TH, what does that mean? EMAC is the name of the manufacturer okay. and 100 TH is uh, designating that type of tube. So, that okay, that's the type of tube we're looking at. And what does this kind of tube do? What was it used for? Um, EMAC, uh, the main business was uh, transmission and radio equipment, radio transmission okay, equipment. Okay, so it's used in radio. And um, this guy here, was probably used as an amplifier for radio signals on an oscillator. Okay, yeah. now um, I noticed something else that's a little bit sad here. Um, this guy looks a little bit busted, huh? How did it break? Well, the damage is a monument to human failure. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a monument to human failure. But on the brighter side, this gives us a chance to have a look uh, at the elements it is made of. 
I see. So because it's broken, it is kind of true, we can take it apart inside the end of the glass envelope here and look at the structure that produces and controls the flow of electrons. Now there are three main elements in this tube. In the center, we have this long wire, which is the cathode. And as Daniel explained before, that's the, that's the element that's producing the electrons. At the top here, we have the anode. Now, it's important to point out that the cathode is more negative than the anode. And the electrons sort of act like magnets. They're attracted to their, to their opposite. So the electrons come out of the cathode, and they're attracted to the anode. Now, at the center here, we have this thing that looks like a little swirly cage, and this is called the control grid. And if we look closely, the control grid has an element on the outside to which we can apply an audio signal. Now, any audio signal is uh, a wave shape, just like we see on the oscilloscope here. Now, it goes from a positive point to a negative point. Now, when we have the audio signal, and if it's being, if a negative if it's more, if the signal is down and it's swinging more negative, um, there's more electrons are blocked from going towards the anode because we have a negative and a negative, and like magnetism, those two don't attract each other. Now, if the audio signal that's applied is more positive, then more electrons are allowed to flow through. And what's really cool is if you look up close, this part here, which is the anode, actually looks like miniature architecture from the movie Metropolis. So since Daniel is more of a sinister nerd, he had the brilliant idea of illustrating the difference between a cathode and a grid by putting on a show for you guys. Since there's no vacuum in the EMAC, if we apply power to it, it's exposed to oxygen and we can watch it burn. So, for our demonstration here, we have a power supply and it's giving us about 13 volts DC, which is, which is enough for us to get some sort of glow. And uh, Daniel? and I are going to connect it to uh, the filament, which we do here, connect it to these terminals. Now, when we flip the switch of the power supply, we should see an impressive glow. So uh, to get um, for maximum impact, we're gonna close down the lights and see what we get. Are you excited? <laughs> Trying to burn the filament, uh, we figured out that it um, is broken. It's broken all the way through. So there's no, there's not going to be a burning explosion or anything happen from this one. Um, so we have another plan. Unfortunately for Daniel, he's had uh, bad luck with more than one Emac tube before. So he was able to get us another one. Uh, right here, it's a different tube, but as you can see, it's still Emac. Not exactly sure what year it's from, but clearly it's still uh, old-fashioned. And what's cool here is uh, it's busted in a way so I can take the anode completely out uh, so we can see even more of the glow. Excellent. So let's give this one a shot. Okay. No. Oh, whoa! Wow! Mm-hmm. 